Grace to you and peace from the creative God who's called us into being, the Christ who once lived among us and the spirit who lives among us still. The good news this morning is found in this line from the gospel. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Sadly, the next line is, but you would have none of it. So let's hope that we are willing to be gathered under God's wings and cared for. If you've not already done so, we we'll invite you to turn off your cellular phone or at least put it on silent. If you've got electronic devices, turn those off as well. Carol's making a list so she can do contact tracing. I'm assuming she registered your attendance as she came in. If not, let her know. So that in case we need to communicate with people, we can so do. We're continuing, even though we're removing masks, and doing some distancing so that people can be as safe as they choose to be so we're not passing the offering plate back and forth. We invite you to still contribute to the life of this church by doing an offering in the back, by mailing it in for those of you who are online watching, by mailing it in as well. Let me begin with a series of announcements. Our mission together is, of course, to embody the love of God together. And Jerry, who's the head of the mission team, uh, outreach team will be sharing some things that are coming up. Oh my goodness, I got a shock from this thing. It must be my electric personality. That's huh? it. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so all of us, I'm sure, are incredibly heart torn on what's going on in the Ukraine uh, country right now. Uh, with Putin's war going on and it's it's to me it just seems ridiculous but these are Christians that really need our help and the UCC organization does have a fund set up for the monies to go right to where it's needed uh, we do have a plate out back next to the offering plate that you can give to the uh, UCC Ukrainian relief fund now so um, please find it in your heart to uh, uh, give to that fund as well. You, you know, you may have already given in some other way, shape, or form, and that's terrific. Um, this is just another avenue that you can give to that. So, um, Also, I wanted to talk about the plant sale. We are moving forward on May 6th and 7th is the plant sale, and uh, we're all excited about that. Um, later on, as we get closer, I'll be talking some more about that. <clears throat> and then we are going to be digging perennials this year. Uh, we will start to do that the two weeks before the plant sale, so right around the last two weeks of, uh, of uh, April. And uh, all you need to do is uh, give me a call. I'll put my phone number in the refrigerator reminders, and then I'll come over, and some other people will be helping me too, and we'll come over and, and dig up whatever you can give to the plant sale. This is 100% profit to our mission and outreach, so I think this is a good... Uh, avenue to do to dig perennials and then lastly I wanted to just give you a heads up that in May May 30th and 31st we will be responsible for Hope Haven again so uh, I will have uh, sign up sheets for that as we get closer to that time as well but uh, just wanted to give you a heads up now all right thank you very much have a celebration and then uh, two prayer requests. So the celebration, although he didn't say this, um, Bob's family outed him, it's his birthday today. <laughs> He's older than he probably would like to admit, but on the other hand, that's a good thing. So happy birthday, Bob. also have a prayer request, well, two prayer requests. One, I would pass on to you what was already in the uh, refrigerator reminder that Anita Ide's father died, so you want to keep her family in prayer. And also, um, Mike Grork and uh, Carolyn both asked that we pray for the repose of their friend Dennis Bishop. Tim Blickhan will be playing the part of Carolyn Cannon this morning. She and Mike got on an airplane and are heading out to that service, so I'm glad that Tim was willing to fill in for that. 
terms of worship this morning, the passages you have read, they've been in the refrigerator reminder. They balance, and I'm going to use them to balance between two ways of looking at Jerusalem. One of which is the usual positive way you can find in the Psalms and a lot of hymns that we sing. The other is Jesus' indictment of it. I will suggest that Jerusalem is not different from us. There's good and bad between all of that. The first hymn that we sing is a traditional Lenten one. It's to a tune you'll know. You may have used these words before. We'll then use Jesus, Remember Me. It's a chant from the Tzai community as a response. And then the final hymn makes use of the language of God as female, as Mother Hen, um, that will appear in the Gospel lesson. I'm going to change the order of serves a little bit because this is the second Sunday and we'll have church school. Following the call to worship, I'll work with the art um, pieces that are in your bulletin and that you may have picked up on your way in. And then um, we'll move on to the call of confession after that, after the young folks go to where they're going to gather for church school. So let's begin worship with the introit. God invites us to journey in the way of faithfulness, to walk, to walk the Lenten road, road with, with Christ. Christ. We journey with confidence, for Christ is with us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God, God for God's, God's steadfast, steadfast love. love. So before I use the artwork, there's another announcement I should make that I forgot. I got an email from Rick Amoskita. There's going to be a poetry reading for the benefit of Ukrainian refugees. It's going to take place Friday, April the 1st at 7 p.m. at St. Paul's Episcopal Church down on Normal Road. You'll know where that is. Doing this announcement because three people from this congregation will be taking part in the poetry reading. It'll be Bonnie and Rick and then Becky Parfit. Pick this up on your way in. Okay, okay. would you do me a favor and run back and grab yours? Or do you need them in the front also? They got it? Perfect. So on this piece of paper, there are two pictures. He's sturdy enough he can handle this. You'll think that the one on the top was Mr. Gorchels, who just was up here talking. <laughs> but it's really not. And you know that I'm teasing about that, correct? You could also say, you know who else it kind of looks like? Kind of looks like an angry Santa Claus. So we don't know what God looks like because no one knows what God looks like because God does not have a body. And I need to tell you that right now. But when they do paintings, they try to find ways to describe God. So oftentimes what they'll do is use an older man with a white beard who looks kind of unhappy. And that's not my favorite way to describe God. We're going to read a story a little later, which you won't hear, but Jesus is going on his way to Jerusalem, and he says what he would really like to do to the people in Jerusalem is be like a mother hen who gathers her chicks under her wing, and that's the lower picture. Have you encountered chickens? You've been on farms where there's chickens, seen mother chickens go around? Okay, so you may have seen this happen before. There's rain coming or something unpleasant, there's loud noises, she'll call all the chicks and she'll gather them together. And that's kind of an interesting way to think about God, who really wants to care for us and kind of bring us together. Now I'm going to tell you something else about this picture, which we probably won't do here, but we did in the church where I was before. There's a special kind of a cookie called a biscotti. Have you ever eaten a biscotti? There are these hard cookies, and you can do this wonderful thing with them, which your parents usually won't let you do. You're supposed to dunk them in things. So if you have a biscotti, you can dunk it in coffee or dunk it in milk and eat it. They're made that way. 
And one of the things that some churches do on Palm Sunday is make big biscottis in the shape of a chicken to remind people of this particular story, and then everybody gets to break off a piece and dunk it in something, which I think was kind of fun when you do it. So thanks for thinking about God as pictures with me. You can head off to be with Courtney and Colleen, and I think you're going to talk about another story this morning, but we'll see you again after worship. And if anybody's up for making chicken biscotti on Palm Sunday, we'll all be happy to eat it, I am sure. All right. Let us call ourselves a confession. It was Maya Angelou who once said, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. That is good advice when selecting political leaders or a life partner. What that may miss, though, is the capacity of people to change, grow, and mature. We all know people we might have discarded from our lives based on how they were. But with time, patience, and maybe a large dose of God's grace, they became different people, and we are grateful to still have them in our lives. The question is, are we one of those people who other people are still believing in despite showing them who we are, or at least who we were. Authentic self-awareness takes great courage because it means being honest and willing to be changed. So may each of us make this Lenten journey courageously so someday when we show someone who we really are, we will want them to believe us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious, Gracious God, God Bless, Bless us with accurate self-sight. We, we think of ourselves more highly or more lowly than we ought. Forgive us for looking the other way when we know what is happening is wrong. Give us the courage to work for the good, even when it means sacrifice on our part. Give us a sense of shame and outrage with injustice wherever we find it. Give us the strength to admit our sin, for we would live in the freedom of the forgiven. Make us into the people you wish us to be, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We invite you in a time of quiet to be as specific as you wish or dare. So I invite you to join me in the assurance of pardon. God is compassionate and gracious, gracious slow, slow to anger, anger abounding in love. love. For as high as, as the heavens are above the earth, earth, so great is God's love for those who revere God. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Praise, Praise be, be to God. God. Amen. I invite you to stand for the opening hymn.
Be seated. So the Psalms can be divided into a number of categories. There are laments, there are songs of thanksgiving, and then there are these great hymns or songs of praise to Jerusalem, of which Psalm 22 is one. It's part of a set um, called the Psalms of Ascent. The psalmist, we think, wrote them so that people would sing them as they were marching up the hill to the temple. But this psalm, we'll read a portion of it, is calling us to give thanks for Jerusalem, to praise it in particular because the temple is there. And it speaks highly of Jerusalem and what happens in the temple and all the good that may come from that. And it's worth reading because indeed we are heirs to the gifts of Jerusalem, which is the tradition from which Jesus comes, in which we are rooted, the Hebrew scriptures that we share with them. So the psalmist invites us to sing and say, I was glad because they said to me, we will go to God's temple. Our feet are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city designed to accommodate an assembly. The tribes go up there, the tribes of God the sovereign, where it is required that Israel give thanks to the name of God. Indeed, the leaders sit there on thrones and make legal decisions on the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love her prosper. May there be peace inside your defenses and prosperity inside your fortresses. For the sake of my brothers and sisters and my neighbors, I will say, may there be peace in you. For the sake of the temple of our God, I will pray for you to prosper. So the gospel reading is from the 13th chapter of Luke, not the third. In Lent, we're going to skip ahead, a ways, and around. So we're leaping to a section when Jesus is moving towards Jerusalem. He will then, following this particular set of verses, teach in parables, and then he will go ahead and then move towards and enter into the city. Now, the Pharisees are sometimes portrayed as the opponents of Jesus. In this reading, they are being friendly to Jesus either because they do recognize their kinship or because they follow the old proverb, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But nevertheless, they are coming to warn him about Herod's intents. He responds by simply saying, I'm going to keep doing what it is I'm going to do. And then he moves on to that section that I quoted earlier when I showed you the picture of the hen. So at that time, some Pharisees came up and said to Jesus, get away from here, because Herod wants to kill you. But he, that is Jesus, said to them, go and tell that fox, look, I am casting out demons and performing healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the next day because it is impossible that a prophet should be killed outside Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would have none of it. Look, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. So here end these readings. May God add a blessing to this reading of the word. Remain seated as we sing the response. So let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, we ask that you cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Spirit, so that we might love you and pray. 
praise you and follow the way of Christ our Savior. In quiet, we invite you to give thanks for the gifts you've been given this past week, gifts by others or God, for the ways that God has made God's self known to you and to us. For the wisdom and the surprises, for the support and the opportunities, for all the blessings, for all the ways that your grace has come to us, we give you thanks, O oh God. We pray this day in the midst of war and death. Our headlines tell us of fighting in Ukraine, and we, of course, are worried and compassionate. But there are also people at war and suffering in places we do not hear much about. Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, an open drug war in Mexico. And so we would pray for all those who suffer there and pray that our eyes and our ears might be open to all and pray for the courage to ask ourselves why the suffering of some seems more newsworthy than the suffering of others. We ask that you give us patience. Patience in this time to endure hardship and delay and frustration. Patience and persistence so that we might pursue the ways and means and mechanisms of peace. In quiet, we would pray for those who are in need. For those whose names we know, for those whose names we do not know, and for those who have no one to pray for them, we pray to you, O oh God. And we would pray for the people each of us will meet this week, those we look forward to meeting, and those we would rather not. May we love them with the mind and the heart of Christ. Christ, you who died from and for our sins, we pray for those who turn to you and ask to be forgiven and made new. Christ, who shared our griefs, we ask that you would comfort the sorrowing. Christ, who thirsted on the cross, we ask that you would bring relief to the hungry. Christ, you who were forsaken by all, be with the lonely and the sad. Christ, you who were mocked and scorned, support the outcasts and the rejected. Christ, who suffered great pain, be a strength to the weak. Faithful God, on the cross, your Son embraced the power of death and broke its hold over your people. So we ask that you draw all people to yourself and lead us so that we might put aside the deeds of death and choose the life you have offered us. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the gift and the command and the promise of prayer, receive ours. We would bind them together in the words of the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I wanted to wait until all the latecomers arrived so I could congratulate all of you on two things. First, you know how to set your clocks ahead. And second, you also got up. So well done. So on the one hand, I was glad because they said to me, we will go to God's temple. Our feet are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. And on the other hand, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would have none of it. And finally, gracious God, we ask that you bless us with accurate self-sight. We think of ourselves more highly or more lowly than we ought. So on Monday morning, I gather with a group of men from this congregation via Zoom, and sometimes we have topics when we talk, sometimes we make it up as we go along. So it was an interesting session. A couple weeks ago, the topic was book banning. And as I said at the beginning of our gathering, there's nothing more fun than having a good old-fashioned book burning, which of course I've never attended, but book banning happens in a variety of settings, and we're having it happen again although the book banning that's taking place here is a little less threatening than in some places in this sense. They're not yet jailing people for teaching and reading certain books, but in some districts, teachers can be fined if they say certain things or offer certain books to be read. Now, I understand the impulse behind book banning, but I'd rather we don't ban books I think there are sometimes reasons to restrict books, and that morning I said that there were some books that I suggested my children not read at certain points in their lives, or if they did, I warned them of terrible things that were going to happen so they did not become too attached to the characters in the story. Because when you're young and you begin to read and identify with characters, when they die or have horrible things happen, it's wrenching. And for me, that's a reason to not so much restrict but talk about it. But book banning is a different matter. And why books are banned can vary from left to right. But the impulse is, we don't like this, so it shouldn't be read or said or discussed. Now, this comes up from time to time. One of my favorite comments about book banning comes from E.B. White, who wrote columns for The New Yorker and also children's books, which sometimes are banned. Things like Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little, and my favorite is The Trumpet of the Swan, which I recommend to you if you've never read. It's about a swan who learns how to play a trumpet, and it's a delightful book. But White, in the midst of this, was complaining because the book banners wanted to get rid of all books that weren't balanced and fair. And his comment was, we don't really want balanced books because all in all, balanced books are boring. What you want are balanced libraries. And you have in your hand, sometimes, a balanced library, it's called the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't have one book, it has many, and they do not speak with one voice. So I'm going to show you what you won't be able to see because most of you wisely sit farther back. This is one of my favorite preaching books. It's called Parental Guidance Advised, Adult Preaching from the Scriptures. And because there are stories in Scripture that is probably better if you don't read them to your children. Now, this quotation is attributed to Mark Twain, which means he probably never said it, but nevertheless, I like it. The saying is this. When I was young, I once read the Bible, and I have not drawn a sweet breath since. There are stories there that are painful and unpleasant, but it's not just those stories. As I spend more and more time in ministry, I'm more and more drawn to the wisdom literature. Now, the wisdom books are more than these three, but I'm going to name these three. I don't know if you've read them or not. Proverbs, which is the quintessential wisdom book. 
Because in Proverbs, you get lots of advice about how to have a successful life. But standing against that is the book of Ecclesiastes. If you've read Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes is written by someone who did all those things, was successful, and found that it really didn't satisfy. And so one of the best commentaries I know on Ecclesiastes isn't really a commentary, but it's Harold Kushner's wonderful little book, When Everything You've Always Wanted Isn't Enough. The other book that stands against Proverbs is the book of Job. And I told you last week that Job is perfect. Job is someone who does all the things you're supposed to do. His life works out until it doesn't. And then everything goes wrong, and his friends come and tell him to find out how he sinned, what mistake he made to make this happen. And the answer is, he didn't. It just happened. And so they purposely put those three books together because all of them can speak to us in different ways at different times, and I can go on and talk to you about other books that disagree with other books as we go along. And it's done purposely because life is nuanced, and you all know that. And if you don't, I'll give you my phone number, call me, and I'll explain it to you. Because on the one hand, I was glad because they said to me, well, go to God's temple. Our feet are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. On the other hand, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. And finally, gracious God, bless us with accurate self-sight. For we think of ourselves more highly or more lowly than we ought. Lots of good things came from Jerusalem. Lots of bad things came from Jerusalem. And some of us are struggling right now because we know that Israel has a right to exist, and on the other hand, we know the Palestinians have a right to exist and have land. So how do we sort that out and sort it out on the one hand so Israel exists, and on the other hand, so that we can save ourselves from being called anti-Semites. And it's hard to know how to do that and where to stand. But it's not just Jerusalem. A number of the books that they wish for people not to read are books that talk about the ways that America has not been holy ground. And those books can be painful for people who don't want to face into that. But those books are good to read because they end our illusion that we are indeed more highly than we want to be regarded by those who will criticize us. But I know at the same time, it's not all bad because we can point to things that we have done well. We live between those. So how do we balance them? And I, of course, know that you tell children different things at different times because it's appropriate. When your children are young, you want to inspire them. So you tell them good stories. When they're teenagers, they know better. And at that point, you can share with them the unpleasant things that happened but also tales of transcendence and how we get past it. And to not share with them both those things leads them to grow up not as healthy as they might be, either much too triumphant or much too critical or much too on the path to depression. And so I was glad when they said to me, we're going to go to God's temple, and yet... O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who were sent to you. And so what we're after is accurate self-sight. Because we think of ourselves more highly or more lowly than we ought. On Monday night, some of us are reading John Pavlovitz's Lenten devotional. I'm also reading the one that the UCC Still Speaking Writers put out. And Kenneth Samuel wrote this 
this past week. It's a wonderful little piece called self-exoneration. So I won't read you the biblical verse, but then he quotes from Shakespeare. And you'll probably recognize this from Hamlet. This above all to thine own self be true, and it must follow as night the day. You will then not be false to any person. Now our instincts usually are to play to the cameras and try to look good before other people. And I will admit that that's normal and it's a good thing to do because we do not want people cursing us in the street. But on the other hand, it goes overboard and we're too worried about what they think and not always what we think. William Faulkner is not as famous as Shakespeare, but he has this wonderful line that Kenneth didn't quote where he says, don't try to be better than anybody else. Try to be better than yourself, which I think is outstanding advice. And so Kenneth goes on to say, what we forget is that self-examination is more critical than the critique of others. When the cameras are off, the crowds have dispersed, we still have to live with ourselves. And the self-esteem of the psalmist is not dependent on the observations and conclusion of others. Before the verdicts of our peers and pundits are issued, we need to do the tough work of self-examination, the intense work of self-reflection, and the sobering work of self-critique. And so on the one hand, I struggle against people who say everybody is basically good. And I always say, have you looked around and been outside? And I also struggle against people who say people are basically sinful and horrible. And I can also say, have you looked around and looked outside? We're usually both. And so it's worth realizing both about ourselves. And the good news and the blessing in the text is one that I say often before we pray a prayer of confession. It's that line about how I wish I could gather you in as a mother hen gathers her chicks. God is compassionate and forgiving and will gather us in, and that gathering in creates space. Space so that we can tell the truth about ourselves, tell the truth about our country, tell the truth about what's going on in the world, and not be afraid. Because forgiveness is possible, and people can change, and we can, and we need to be aware of both. And I love that good news because it does create that space. It's the space where the forgiven and the redeemed can live. It's the space where we live. And so I invite you to be in that space and be free to look at yourself. Take Faulkner's advice. Try to be better than yourself or take the advice of God and know that you are forgiven and therefore you can live out and embody the grace which has come to you. Amen. We invite you to stand for the hymn.
Be seated. The psalmist proclaims and reminds us that the steadfast love of God is from everlasting to everlasting, but we know our lives are short. We do not have much time to do good to those who walk this journey with us. So let us make haste to love and be quick to be kind. And now may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine on us. May God look in us with kindness, be gracious to us, and give us peace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and went that way, stopping to teach and heal, but never losing sight of his journey's end. So set our face toward you, O God. Give us the grace to stop and respond to human need and the wisdom to not lose sight of our goal. Amen.